to give her. I'm Athena Gentry. I work for the library, and my dream came true the day that Belle said that she would come and, and speak to the, the local community here in Berea at the library. And, I mean, she doesn't know this, but I actually shed a tear. I called, I called the director of the library and said, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> Bell Hooks is going to come to the library. Could we and move that plant so yes, someone could either absolutely. stand or sit there? I mean, it's a nice I'm going to move it now. <laughs> out. Yes, I think oh. out. Yeah. <laughs> well, but we've built such I appreciate we have that agreement. so many people have showed up, and I hope that everybody's okay with a little sweat and humidity. It's worth it. <laughs> well, I mean, was well, there anything interesting you were going to say about bell hooks? I was going to say a lot of interesting things, <laughs> but you can probably say it a lot more eloquently than I can. We have someone else in the hall. Yeah, yeah we're yes. trying to move yes. the plant to get them in. I'm moving down. Downwardly mobile. I'm so sorry. Don't be sorry. see here. Well, as I was thinking about today, Athena, say anything you want to say. Give us two things you were going to say about Bell Hooks. Bell Hooks. Bell Hooks is she's not just a local treasure, she's a national treasure. And the Bell Hooks Institute was. There were people that tried to persuade Bell Hooks to have the institute in much larger cities. And I'll let Bell explain her answer on that. But we are all so fortunate. And I'm, I'm excited and a little out of breath from moving stuff around. But everyone, Bell Hooks at the library. <laughs> You got one up there too. Okay. Hey, yeah. And a chair in the throne. The throne. The king on the throne. King, please introduce yourself. <laughs> I'm Lauren Johnson, and that's what's been said. <laughs> <laughs> and there's someone on the end there. Sherry is in the box. Sherry is introducing so, herself. Sherry. Yes. I uh, have lived in this room for a long time, <clears throat> and I'm a retired teacher, and I uh, have a tape for abuse. I'm Patty Gonzalez, and I'm awesome. Uh, <laughs> I'm an artist at Moody. <laughs> okay, have we covered the waterfront? Oh. Tina. Tina, I know. I, I apologize, <laughs> Tina. Tina's an artist, poet. Yes, yeah. so I'm from Bristol, Virginia. I'm a poet. I, and very important, if you know Bristol, it's the Virginia side. That's where I grew up, and I've been here eight years. Okay, this is going to be too many people. Carol, <laughs> where are you hiding? Oh, right there in the, the, the chair. It doesn't belong to you. Okay. Well, Carol is a local um, theologian and counselor. <coughs> and next to you, Carla, and then we'll get going here. Me? Yeah. 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 I've temporarily been here for 40 years. <laughs> I went to school here, and uh, my name is Barbara Baker, and uh, I went to school here and came hey, back. I went to Berea. And then um, came back temporarily about 40 some years ago and taught the community school for many years, and so I'm retired. I'm here. Well, as I was thinking of, of talking today, I was thinking about my own journey back to Kentucky, having grown up in Hopkinsville, but most importantly, where I discovered art um, in terms of being an artist was in my high school. And I was thinking about just how important art in the schools were to some of us, because coming from working class homes or poor homes, that was the one place where art um, was really validated as something we should do. And I owe a great deal to our my art teacher, Mr. Harold, who encouraged me to make art. Um, this is my book about art, Art of My Mind. And I got a grant from the New York Arts Council to um, create art pieces about my grandmother's house. 
and it burned down a few days later. And I was very discouraged. Um, but then I thought, well, I would go down and take photographs and then make um, work from, this is actually, uh, aluminum siding is good for something. Everything else burn up in the old house, but this is just the front of the house. And if you look closely, you'll see uh, the police tape around the house saying, do not enter. But so I created this piece and it had writing that said, my heart is burning in this house where love was, where I dreamed in the dark my deepest dreams. It was my grandmother's house. And as those of us who live here know, when you live in a small town, I still remember when my mom called and said that it was her mom's house, that it was on fire, and that she went there and she was watching it burn. And she kept saying it was such a hurting thing. Um, and so that's how this particular piece of art, which um, is in the Bell Hooks Institute. Did you say who you were? No. Mm, you were trying to escape me. That purple shirt cannot escape. No. <laughs> Your name? I'm Tom Worth. We've lived here since last October. And I'm Jim. Thank you for being here. And then there's uh, Betty. Betty that just came in. <laughs> Hi, um, Bell. Hi. Thank you all for coming. Of course, I said, well, there's probably only going to be John and Ramona because they told me at church they were coming. Um, I was just thinking a lot about where where does art come from? You know, where does that impulse um, to create something come from? And it's interesting for me because I don't think, I think of myself as the writer as artist. I keep hoping one day I'll have you know, big exhibit, the writer as artist, because writing is my true primary calling. But sometimes I really need to move in a space beyond words. Though lately every art piece I do has words. Um, I've been mixing the two. But it was in high school that I began to paint. Um, I was totally carried away by abstract expressionism. And I remember when our art teacher told us, choose a form of establish art and paint like it. Um, and that was when I began to learn a lot about the abstract expressionists. Um, all throughout my life, I have made art, um, but it's kind of been my closeted world. But no more, because in the Bell Hooks Institute, first and foremost, um, I have hoped to bring contemporary African art, African American art to our community. So there is a gallery called the Yaw Gallery, um, and it has my collection of contemporary African American artists. And it has more paintings by me than are ever going to be seen anywhere <laughs> in the world. Um, and uh, I wanted to, I, I did a series of paintings, um, and this is one. It's not really a painting. I seem to like to work with photographs and paint. But this is me as a child, and it says, when I remember, I see red. <laughs> um, thinking about the anger children can have at pain and sorrow, and again, how do you express that? She looks like such a happy baby. So I was very interested in the contrast between the happy baby and the line, when I remember, I see red. Um, I did a series of paintings for a show for Joseph Albers, um, because he had made the whole question of color. And so they're all in red. And this is an artist book that I did called When I Remember I See Red. And everything in it, of course, is painted red. And, um, and at the end of it, it, it says, this do in remembrance. We are born and have our being in a place of memory. We chart our lives by everything we remember, from the mundane moment to the majestic. We know ourselves through the art and act of remembering. And when we lose sight of who we are, when we lose touch, when we lose our minds, we find ourselves through talking cure, cures, that root sense of psychoanalysis, psychotherapy, that are always an enactment of remembering. In these courageous acts of remembering, 
We dare to use memory as a thread to mend, bind, and gather together broken bits and pieces of ourselves, our wounded hearts. Memories offer us a world where there is no death, where we sustain loss by rituals of remembrance. These paintings evoke the strength of my first memory of color, the primacy of red, thrilling, shocking, intense, life-affirming. Merging with the passion of remembrance of both personal intimacy, the evocation of childhood trauma, abuse, and political rem reminiscence, these paintings bear witness. One of the paintings that I put in here is um, continual little portraits of the four little black girls who were killed in the Birmingham bombing and with their names, Denise, Carol, Carol Abby, and Cynthia in 1963, because it always disturbed me that people referred to them only as the four little girls <laughs> and that we didn't remember their names. Um, but, so this is that artist's book, uh, which came after Art on My Mind. It's, it's interesting being both a critic and an artist, because most of these are critical essays with artists. Um, I say here in high school, I painted pictures that won prizes. My art teacher, a white man whom we called Mr. Harrell, always promoted and encouraged my work. I can still remember him praising me in front of my parents. To them, art was play. It wasn't something real, not a way to make a living. To them, I was not a talented art artist because I couldn't draw the kind of pictures that I would now call documentary portraits. <laughs> the images I painted never looked like our familiar world, and therefore, in their minds, I could not be an artist. And even though Mr. Harold told me I was an artist, I really couldn't believe him. I have been taught to believe that no white person in this newly desegregated high school knew anything about what black people's real lives were all about. After all, they didn't even want to teach us. How then could we trust what they taught? It didn't matter that Mr. Harrell was different. It did not matter to grown folks that in his art classes, he treated black students like we had a right to be there, deserved his attention and his affirmation. It didn't matter to them, but it began to matter to us. We ran to his classes, we escaped there. We entered the world of color, the free world of art, and in that world, we were momentarily whatever we wanted to be. That was my initiation. I longed to be an artist, or whenever I hinted that I might be an artist, grown folks looked at me with contempt. They, had, they told me I had to be out of my mind <laughs> thinking about being an artist, that black folks could be artists. Why, you can eat art. Nothing folks changed, said changed my longing to enter the world of art and be free. Life taught me that being an artist was dangerous. The one grown black person I met who made art lived in a Chicago basement. A distant relative of my father's, cousin Skyler was talked about as someone who had wasted his life dreaming about art. He was lonely, sad, and broke. At least that was how folks saw him. I don't know how he saw, how he saw himself, only that he loved art and he loved to talk about it. And there in the dark shadows of his basement world, he initiated me into critical thinking about art and culture. Cousin Schuyler talked to me about art in a grown up way. He said he knew I had the feeling for art and he chose me to be his witness, <coughs> to be the one who would always remember the images. I had been taught to hold such images close, to look at art, and think about it, to think art, and keep it on my mind. So um, I felt like that's enough to sort of open it up so we can talk together about art. I'll start. Um, I, can relate, I can relate to first being a writer, then an artist. About 20 years ago, I, um, I lived in the city of Pittsburgh and there was an art festival along the river in downtown Pittsburgh every year for years and years and years. And one beautiful June day, I'm driving back on the parkway to a suburban area where I lived and thinking of all the art I had just looked at for a couple hours. And all of a sudden a thought came through my mind and said, 
You could do that. You could do that. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget, you know? And I thought, yeah. And then I started thinking about what I would do with art. And then I didn't do anything with it. And it took years, and really until I moved here, to really let the artist off. And I, I've done some painting. Um, yeah, the painting, I guess, is my big, the big thing. And, and, and entered three boards that I painted for a Mardi Gras exhibit. Um, so, and took pictures of them and have it the document and given them away as gifts because I wanted to sell them, but they didn't sell. So I ended up giving, and the people who received them loved them. Just loved them. Well, I think um, what, that's part of the magic of Berea. I mean, I have had the good fortune to, to both support art at the Berea Arts Council, which I urge all of you to do. That is, donate some money for upcoming shows and events, but also to show work there. The Louise May Alcott piece that is on display was made for the Arts Council when they did their show on Louise May Alcott. Um, so um, be sure, I, I am one of those who continue to grieve that the Art Council isn't downtown anymore because I could pop into it all the time and I don't, I pop less in Old Town. Um, but still, it's it adds so much to our community, and it has added to me because it, it encouraged me to, to continue to make art and to show it. We had the show in the box, for which I created a piece um, with Buddhas that said, "Do not seek perfection in a changing world; instead, perfect your love." I wanted to say thank you also. Thank you so much for doing this. I, um, <coughs> Thanks, this, Betty. this incites the artist in me again, and it, you know, so. who else out there is thinking? George, what are you doing in your retirement? Making some art? Me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, but I, I do think we can do both. Uh, we can, we can work to uh, change the world and also work to to change ourselves. I was reading uh, a book, The Artist as Citizen, by Joseph, of course I'm forgetting his last name, he was head of uh, Juilliard for years, but he talked about how important it is for the artist to be politically aware and engaged, um, to bring certain values um, that are our cultural values into work and to be able to share those values with other people. Example, you talk about being artistic, but it's not limited to like paint or exactly. pottery or a pen or, it's also, you can be creative in other ways and, and sharing uh, ethnicities, like if you're in the kitchen, you can be creative with what you're preparing. And if you uh, invite guests and you want to share other culture, you can prepare that type of food. So you can be an artist anywhere in a walk in the woods you see some sticks and rocks and you know it's there so well, what I do I, with it there's a poet who writes about levels and degrees of light I think that there are probably levels and degrees of art making because I think there there probably is a great difference between a Picasso and my cooking something in my kitchen <laughs> no matter how arty I am to do it <laughs> But I agree with you that you can bring that spirit. It's in the eye of the beholder. Ah. Someone else? What are you thinking? Well, as a weaver, I see the, um, how do you put it, the, the conflict sometimes be between whether or not it's an art or a craft and the delineation there. And um, I've, I've come to see it blending more. Well, I was just thinking when you said that, that both and, that something can be a craft and then it can also have those characteristics. A lot of it depends on devotion. The reason I don't think of myself as a visual artist in the way I do as a writer is I am absolutely 100% devoted to writing. It is a spiritual practice in my life. Yesterday I was interviewed by the New York Times and I was saying, you know, every day of my life, I get up and I do my spiritual practice, 
my prayers, my meditation, and then I proceed to do my writing. And, you know, to be as young as I am, a mere 60-something, and to have written so many books, um, called for a level of discipline and dedication and devotion. And that is not something I have given to the visual art, um, that level of constancy um, that I have given to the writing. And it's not that I devalue the art, it's just that I think as you, as you write and you write, you mature. I always liken myself to Michael Jordan because I loved it when Michael Jordan said, you know, I was born with certain gifts, but in order to be a great ball player, I have to practice. And when I think of writing in terms of craft, I think about the practice of writing for me. The, the fact that I have to, to, I think I have to, but I write every day. Um, and I tell myself, even if you just write a sentence, it's, it's, it's the practice um, that matters. I was remembering that my husband used to fish, but he'd do the catch and release. But my daughter got very upset that he did it at all. So she started making fish. And she made a card shark, and a calico bass, and a rainbow trout, and I have all these in my house. And a lutefisk. And, and, oh, and a lutefisk, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which reminds us again that inspiration can come from all kind of sources. Um, you know, I, when I was younger, I was often inspired by my dreams. I've been reading Thomas More, M-O-O-R-E's book, The Soul, of religion, and he talks so much about the Jungian idea of dreams as a sort of gateway um, to the eternal. But I, I remember when I wrote Happy to be Nappy, you know, it was like <laughs> in the middle of the night I was lying in bed and I, I got this sentence, you know, girl pie hair smells clean and sweet. It's soft like cotton. And I'm thinking, what, what? But being such a devotee of art, I got right out of bed and <laughs> wrote that little paragraph down. Of course, I said to Disney when they published the book, when's the movie? <laughs> and they said to me, it's only a paragraph. <laughs> and I said, but you're Disney. Um, and, and that was for my children's book, Happy to be Nappy. But I was so struck by that whole sense of, for me, it's why I'm a believer in the divine, because where does that come from? Where, where does it come from that I'm lying in bed and this whole little book comes to me and it has in it, uh, growing up there was a little juke joint called the Dew Drop In. Um, and things arrived in my books like that that were part of our childhood. Um, and, you know, where do they come from? To me, that's part of the magic of religion, this mystery that I have no idea. But it's interesting that parents, you know, I had all these parents that have been writing to me saying, you should write something for children. You know, if people are already messed up by the time they're 20, <laughs> reading a bell hooks book isn't going to solve the problem. <laughs> and I just remember thinking, I'm not a happy person. I'm an intellectual. There's no way I can write books for children. But of I course, so happy. <laughs> I, I lift it up to the divine, like, is this the direction I should be going in? And there it was in that magical moment. But think about how even in that artistic moment, there's obedience, that we can receive something from the divine, but we have to be willing to listen to what we're receiving and be obedient. Um, and for me, be, I, mean, I can tell you this, I'm not a remember my dreams kind of person. Um, and so if I don't get up, and write right away. I don't tend to recapture something I've been thinking or uh, feeling, um, which is probably why my bed has lots of mounds of little papers uh, with things written on them. Um, that sort of sense of what it means to be inspired and enchanted. Um, because I don't ever think it comes from me. I feel like I'm a vessel, and it presents itself to me. Um, and my charge is to put it out there, to be, to be willing to listen to the call. 
which was very hilarious because, of course, the more I wrote children's books, the happier I got. <laughs> but I don't know that the children's books were doing it, but just that I made a greater choice in my life. And you know, all the new happiness books tells us that it is a choice. People from all walks of life, from poverty to wealth, recognize that being happy is a choice that we make in our lives. What are you thinking about, Tina? I think I was thinking I agree a lot with the receiving. I feel like that as well, but I think there's also a good deal of scrappiness to it because I have to constantly make that space with all the different roles going on, and I think of it as uh, sometimes calling. <laughs> like I'm going to make sure I'm letting myself be in that mode where I can receive. Well, you've got husband yeah. and children and job. I mean, when I was being interviewed yesterday, I was talking about the enormous life of privilege I have lived into because I have no partner, I have no children, I have no, you know, have so little things that actually take me away. I mean, when I was busy working a job and teaching, and I feel like that's when I ruined my health because I was doing it all and very, you know, uh, maniacally. You could find me, I always remember days in New York City where there was no heat in my apartment, but I'd have on my gloves and my hat and my coat, and I'd be sitting at my desk um, writing. I don't even think I can do that now. It's like, really? <laughs> um, but I was just that hot and inspired. You know, if something inspired me, I just really had to, to get it out. And I, I'm a curious writer because I write across so many genres that I am a poet, written plays. I did a play with um, Shan, for Shan Yers' book that he did, and um, you know, that I write critical essays and, of course, feminist theory. Someone I was, else? I, I was thinking about what you were saying the joy. When I, when I write, some of my best writing happens you know, after I've written, and then I don't turn on the cell phone and I just wander off. And so it's the joy of the solitude while not really the, something still with you as, as you travel. And um, I had that too in a dream one time. I remember a live voice just came to me when I was dreaming. The voice said, I don't call them butterflies. I call them wildflowers of the sky. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I just thinking those kind of things. You sit down and you create them as well as they disappear. And of course, when I do critical theory, it's much more thought out. Um, than it is, it's, it's not, doesn't have for me that magical quality um, of receiving. Usually it's, it's piecing together things like a puzzle, um, piecing together race, gender, class. Uh, the reporter asked me yesterday, you know, you use this phrase, imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchy. Why? What I liked about it is that it doesn't rank any form of oppression over another. And that it, it reminds me all the time that the root issue is domination and that it takes this interconnected form. Um, but that was something that, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking through and thinking, thinking really going to other cultures where people talk, have much more political discussions in everyday life. Um, I remember the first time I went to Germany and the Turkish men were in the train stations having these very robust political discussions. And I kept thinking, well, how would I define the political system I live within? Um, that democracy is not an adequate word um, and so, you know, my mind set to work, um, thinking about all the things that I thought impinge um, upon our lives. I'm going to just um, say a little bit about the Bell Hooks Institute because, um, as you can probably tell, I'm a modest sort of girl. The, <laughs> the reporter asked me, how, how, did I, how could I let not let celebrity and stuff go to my head. And I said, are you kidding? <laughs> I live in Berea. <laughs> I said, I, I walk around Berea mostly as Gloria Watkins um, and not as Bell Hooks. Um, and in fact, someone said to me, is Bell Hooks a person? <laughs> and, um, but part of what 
what I felt very strongly and feel very strongly is everything that I am was made in the, in the ground of Kentucky. And both in my book, Belonging, and at this, this, these you know, wonderful years of my life that are leading to a wonderful death, um, Kentucky, I have wanted to bring that forth, both for the type of student that comes to Berea, to know that you can be a Kentucky rural person who also becomes cosmopolitan, that you can be, you know, when someone <coughs> tells me, oh, I was in Ghana last week in some little hut, and there was a Bell Hooks book. Um, there's something about that that it, it just enchants me um, that I both hear and have gone so far, mm -hmm. and, or, you know, uh, the many, many places when the Australian Aborigine women contact me because they're using my work in tribal disputes. Um, I think so much about um, what it meant to grow up in a small town in Kentucky. And part of why I wanted the institute here, it houses my archives and my artifacts in partnership with Berea College is I thought, if people are coming from around the world to, to look at my life when I'm dead or in, in the years that I'm alive, I wanted them to be able to come to Kentucky. I wanted them to hear our vernacular speech. Uh, Berea is very similar to what Hopkinsville was like 60 years ago. Um, it's a much bigger little city in Kentucky now, but I wanted people to actually have the flavor of what it is to be in Kentucky. And they couldn't do that if my papers were in the Bonnicky at Yale or um, in the Du Bois Center at Harvard. And so this is my dream, uh, though in a very snotty way, Henry Louis Gates, who's head of the Du Bois Center at Harvard, told me, you only think you want ordinary people uh, coming into your, your, your papers and stuff. You don't want their hands on your papers. And I thought it was so interesting because that's precisely my dream <laughs> that um, part of what I hope the Institute will do, as some of you have already been at some of my, I hate the word salons because I don't think of them as salons, but my dream is of educating outside colleges and universities so that like when Gloria Steinem came, uh, we brought lots of women from the hollers of Kentucky, many of whom did not have college education to just talk in a small group with, with her. Because I think we, we can go to big lectures, but it's not the same thing to sit in a, in a, in a small room with someone, uh, like when Cornell West came, where people could actually ask him the kind of questions that you don't necessarily feel you can ask in a large group. But it's been such a wonderful blend of different groups of people. And so I'm hoping the Institute will continue that. Um, this is our 25th year of women's studies at Berea College, which I think is really awesome. Yes. <laughs> and so I'm interacting with women's studies so that we can bring a number of people here um, to talk about build women in power and leadership. So um, I will be, one of the events at the Bell Hooks Institute will be our own Dr. Linda Leake, who's become Vice President of Diversity, will come and talk to us about what diversity means for her and listen to us tell her what we hope she'll do as an officer of diversity. And so I, look, I have great plans for the Bell Hooks Institute and um, I have an assistant that's coming um, from New York to work with me for a year, helping me to gather everything, but also to help me to open the place so I look forward to seeing many of you um, there to see the works of contemporary African-American artists um, and to peruse some of the bell hooks um, paraphernalia. It's, it's all, I, uh, Audrey Lord sold her papers to, or gave her papers maybe to Spelman, and she gave her hair. And I said, I've said to people, I guarantee you, I will not be leaving my hair. <laughs> she had a beautiful dreadlocks, so I guess there, there was some logic to <laughs> leaving your hair. Uh, a couple of other questions, comments. Our time is down to just 10 minutes. I want to take time to, if, if I can say that Kentucky made me who I am, I have to really say that the public library created the intellectual bell hooks because 
it was my place to read and to become cosmopolitan. Dreema, you had a question? Any thoughts on um, ways you might be able to integrate in with youth, high school youth and that age group and, and connect them in? And even, because I really think that art can reach a lot of those kids that are falling through the cracks. I think it's so much about, as Buddhist teacher Pima Chodron says, starting with people where they are. And so I think if we, if we can have small groups of teens and, and have them drawing, writing, um, I, as a teacher, I became a big fan of Nathaniel Brandon in his psychotherapy practice, use sentence endings. Um, when Libby and I did a conference here at the college on reconciliation, and my, my thing was all on death, and so I had people do a sentence ending of when I die, I and you finish the sentence and read it, and but you don't you don't take a lot of time to think about it. It's to try to get ideas out there really quickly. I always remember the person who said, um, when I die, um, not if, when, um, because some people were using the if a lot in their, their comments. <laughs> but I, I think that that's one way to get young people thinking about to also think about where where they are, not where we want them to be, um, not where we are. What about that young person sitting next to you? What do you think? Um, well, I definitely think that art uh, has had a great effect on my life as a high school student and uh, in my development as a young adult. And I think that it's definitely a very powerful uh, thing to manifest in the young person's life. I think that um, the Upward Bound program that has focused on high school students and filmmaking has been really awesome. I, I saw a lot of the films um, in past years. I don't know if they did that this past summer, but they were just really awesome. So I think cameras, um, you know, but I mean, it's a monumental task in many ways to start with where people are because you first have to know who people are. Um, and that that's that's the task of the teacher that when you start out in the classroom how to know who it is you're talking with I mean that's why even though it, it actually took only 10 minutes for us to say our names and something about ourselves but it helped us just to know a little bit more about who's here Carla I was just thinking isn't the art of community building being where we are now with each other Absolutely. So, and I think that's and, and very staying with people where they are until and moving with them, or inviting them to come with you. And I think oh, look, look how many of us came, gave testimony about moving here. And I think all the time about how um, my engagement with Berea, my sense of being a Berean, changes each year as I'm here more and more, and as I know people more and more. And, even the different life that I lead on Jackson Street. It's interesting to think of streets as having their own particular magic, but on Estill Street, I did not feel connected to a community because mm -hmm. Estill Street had just cars going by all the time and it did not feel like nosy little Jackson Street where, somebody, <laughs> so, where somebody's watching all the time. And, and I'm a watcher, I fancy myself as a spinster Miss Marvel. <laughs> I'm sitting on my couch watching everything that goes by. Um, and I, I think that that sense changes with space. And I, I know for many of you, those of you who've just been here, Kelly, for six weeks, but Kelly and her partner, Bill, Bill is an incredible potter. And I don't know how much longer the farmer's market will go, but you can see his work. He is an African-American man. Um, there are not that many African-American potters um, running around, um, but you can see his awesome work, and she makes wonderful little prayer flags. It goes till the end of October. <laughs> <laughs> the deep throne king. <laughs> saying at church today, really wonderful. Thank really you. appreciated it. Mm -hmm. um, is there a couple last questions, comment? 
Ramona, I have a practical question. Uh, where is the Bell Hooks uh, Institute physically? And uh, that's a really good question. Well, I thought you <laughs> and uh, how will we know about things that are happening there? Well, we made a poster for the September events that'll come up, and it'll I'm sure be on Berea College event online stuff. Um, the miracle of my life is as soon as this assistant gets here, I'm going to have email. But the institute is located. It? Oh, <laughs> that was very bad. <laughs> located at 300 Center Street. It is where Nancy and Doug lived, the Heinemann House, right. and mm -hmm. before them, you know, was a great house for art. Um, mm -hmm. Teresa had her pottery there, so it's got a long art kind of history in, in the background there. Um, okay, why are, why are people looking We're trying to figure out where that is on Center Street. It's really close to the college. It's across from the first house. It has, I mean, it, it's part of, it's part, it has the big wraparound porch. Yeah. Yeah. It's the that corner, tends to be the key. It's the corner of Center and Rawlings. Yeah. Center and Rawlings. Red brick and we're trying from to decide the if the bushes need to come down because it's a little hard to see. Um, the latest with the wonderful Rose, who takes care of our um, plants, uh, is thinking maybe we could just lower the bushes some so they would be a little more visible. And we hope in the future to have an incredible uh, sign created by Bobby, Bobby Craig um, that will be a nine-pointed uh, star from the quilt pattern. Um, one of the things, speaking of creativity, I am continually awed by the creativity of African-American slaves. And one of the things that was used to point runaway slaves to the Underground Railroad were quilts. And people would hang um, quilts on the line as an example of where you might, like, they're, like you're creating a trail. Um, but of course, after a while, the, the, the dominant folks found out but if you go to Savannah, Georgia, where there is one of the oldest um, African-American churches, what they did was make the ceiling um, into a nine-pointed um, star quilt pattern. And even there, you can, you can follow underneath the floor of the church um, the, the tunnels that led people to places of safety and hiding. So if you're in Savannah, it's one of the really wonderful uh, places to see and to think about, again, that m merger of art and politics. Um, there, there you have the nine-pointed star um, as a quilt pattern. I think I've written an essay um, about the public art thing of the, the quilts patterns that you see on the barns and talking about how People have often been taught that people in Appalachia were too dumb to get abstract art. Um, and so I basically have written an essay that takes a look at abstract expressionism and other forms of modern art and relates them to the quilt um, patterns that are on the barns that so intrigue people of all races and all classes. It's such an amazing Art. And then thinking again about women's power that, you know, I don't know if you know the story, but it was a woman whose mother died and she was a quilter and she wanted to honor her. So she painted on, um, I don't know if it was a house or a barn, her mother's favorite pattern. Um, mine is the Star of David. And when I went away to college, I drugged the Star of David um, quilt top with me. It was not quilted at the time. And it, many of you have heard me tell this story that I, I would not allow anybody to quilt it because I was afraid it would be lost. It's pieced from my mother and her sister's summer dresses. But then I met Alina Strand and she said, you know, you've got to, you got to get this done. And there's a woman, ama amazing quilter in Berea, Miss Pauline. Um, and she can um, she can quilt this for you. And I was so afraid, but we let Miss Pauline have it. 
And some of you may remember the talk she and I gave together at Peanut Butter and Ginger about her sisters and, and the question of racial separatism, but as they were quilting the talk, what they felt they learned about my grandmother from how she did her stitches and the patterns that she chose. Mm -hmm. So I would like to close by saying that's also part of the power of art, that it can bring us together, mm -hmm. that it can connect us in ways that are profound and mysterious. Um, and here is this elderly white woman in Appalachia, you know, who's connecting with a, a black woman who died in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, who couldn't read or write, but who, who made many magical quilts, uh, many of which will be on display in the artifact room at the Bell Hooks mm -hmm. Institute. Thank you, Public yes. Library. <laughs>